Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Good morning and welcome dear friends to the second module of our discussions on gender blurring in Toni Morrison. Published in 1987, Toni Morrison's beloved is often cited to illustrate the concept of gender blurring. Gender roles are social constructs or rather labels which are given to people based on behavior societal and cultural norms as well as expectations. Gender role beliefs shape and in turn are shaped by childhood and adult experiences and thus we find these constructs can also change over a passage of time. Even though it is said that by the time the child is 3 years old has started to realize gender conditioning which is dominantly practiced in the cultural environment of one's place. Therefore, gender roles cannot be escaped. We are also constantly bombarded with images of how we should behave as a girl or as a boy, etc. There are sexually biased societal norms from which the majority of individuals operate. We often fashion our lives according to the dominant gender models available to us according to the media. Gender blurring as a practice sometimes may result in better self-respect, particularly in the context of women as they are considered to be weaker according to the cultural norms. However, we find that almost in equal measure, it can also result in internal diffidence or feelings of societal shame, particularly it is felt by men because masculinity is normally associated with strength. Reading a literary work in the light of this concept illustrates the revisionist potential of the work in the context of later dated interpretations of gender as we have discussed in the previous modules. The concept of gender blurring has also resulted in several ethnographic studies. I would particularly refer to a 2012 thesis by Jasmine Abrams with the title of Blurring the Lines of Traditional Gender Roles, Beliefs of African American Women. The thesis has taken up certain themes for gender role beliefs about women and men within the African American community. These gender role beliefs for women were taken up as having multiple roles, dedication to the care of others, perceived social inferiority and strength. For men, the parameters taken were lack of commitment, strength and mental and emotional immaturity. This study had also tried to assess related contextual factors of gender roles which were assessed on grounds of personal and socio-historical experiences of race. And that is why it becomes very important for us to realize that gender role beliefs of African American women in the United States should be investigated in a manner that considers their unique experiences and the distinct background of their cultural sharing group. We cannot compare them with other ethnic groups. The narrative of Beloved also reinforces this belief. It is set in 1873. Atrocities which were committed on slaves during these times are common history now. History to us reveals only situational facts. It also suppresses sensitivity towards individuals who have to live through those situations. It is only a work of literature 
which is able to unravel the intricacies of experiential patterns which an individual has to suffer while history is being made. In this context, it is pertinent to refer to an interview by Tony Morrison. This interview to Merwin Rothstein, which was published in New York Times, the 26th August 1987 edition, records Morrison's reaction when she first came across the story of the young slave Margaret Garner. I have quoted from this interview in detail. Every single sentence of this interview is a revelation. Morrison says, I quote, I was amazed by this story I came across about a woman called Margaret Garner who had escaped from Kentucky, I think into Cincinnati with four children. And she was a kind of cause celebre among abolitionists in 1855 or 56 because she tried to kill the children when she was caught. She killed one of them just as in the novel. I found an article in a magazine of the period and there was this young woman in her 20s being interviewed. Oh, a lot of people interviewed her, mostly preachers and journalists and she was very calm, she was very serene. They kept remarking on the fact that she was not frothing at the mouth, she was not a mad woman and she kept saying, no, they are not going to live like that. They will not live like the way I have lived." Unquote. Morrison's interview underscores certain things. First of all, it tells us that this woman was interviewed by several people, particularly by preachers as well as journalists. She became a cause celebre among abolitionists during that time. Strangely, Morrison notes, they were repeatedly remarking on the fact that she was not a mad woman, that she came across as a very normal human being who simply wanted to save her children from the trauma which she had to face every day of her life. Morrison is also surprised at this reaction of those people who had interviewed this young lady. In the very first chapter of the novel, Morrison has gendered her characters. We come to know that women are better able to face the presence of beloved while men are afraid and prefer to leave. Protagonist sons leave, even Paul D feels scared and ultimately leaves. It has been remarked in her article by Catherine Rinchen that Sethe, the character who has been modeled on Margaret Garner is perhaps the most masculine character in the novel. Though she normally behaves as a woman, still we find that there are several actions and characteristics of her which can easily be treated as those characteristics which are conventionally understood as masculine ones. For example, she had married another slave Hall. While Hall went mad after seeing the brutalities in front of his eyes, Sethe was able to survive those brutalities even though she was directly the victim. She had struggled to remain alive. This struggle had also given her an inner strength which somehow was not possible to hell to have. We can make out from the characterization that Sethe has remarkable mental strength as well as resilience. While her sons have left the house, she is able to endure the phantom presence with equanimity. After the death of baby Suggs, she stays with Denver, her living daughter, who is not in her full sense because she had had a nervous breakdown earlier. Siti had not spoken about her experiences of her slavery days with others. She had been silent about this trauma for as many as 18 years. It is only with the return of Beloved that she gradually learns to talk about it. We can only imagine the mental effort it must have required her to keep quiet about this past. With what effort she fights back her slavery past is evident when she hears the voice of baby Suggs who advises her to lay down sword and shield and to not study war no more. 
in city's own eyes the future was a matter of keeping the past at bay because the past would have corrupted whatever semblance of future she and her living children could have however it also becomes clear to us that she does not want to fight back her past only for herself she also wants to protect her daughter denver from the experiences of her terrible past the wall like behavior of striving against something is normally associated with masculine characters and therefore we can say that gender blurring is evident again according to bulu it is not only courage which is considered to be a masculine trait but also a readiness to fight which is also manifest in the characters of several african women portrayed in this novel particularly sete the concept of gender blurring is also clear to us in this novel's portrayal of motherhood motherhood has been accepted as being significant by almost every critic even a critic like simon de beauvoir had suggested that the experience of motherhood is necessary for the fulfillment of a woman's life we also see that certain roles are automatically associated with motherhood unlike marriage it is not treated as an institution by several feminist thinkers rather it is also treated as an experience however tony morrison's neo slave narrative suggests that motherhood contains female as well as male character traits it can be very female and very male as an experiences and it has to be regarded as an illustration of gender blurring in itself another aspect of the novel which is important in this context is the racial experiences of the black people and the memory of the harrowing experiences of slavery during the slavery days african american people were not considered as human beings at all they were branded as animals they were not given any identity or gender for example baby sugs is never called by any name by her owner mr garner throughout the narration still we find that the sex of a slave became important to the masters as a woman slave could be exploited in multiple ways she could be treated as a breeder and a milking cow sethe's killing of her child is a central trope of the novel her own experiences of slavery become continuous reference points in the narrative and in this context she often remembers her mother sethe's mother was brought on a ship from africa and was continuously used as a comfort and as a milking cow by slavers as well as by the crew her mother had given birth to some other children also but she had thrown all her children into the sea except sethe she had disowned all her children who were from the crew or from the whites but she had decided to protect the girl who was born out of love from a black man and had decided to give this infant this lover's name however killing of her offspring was an act of hatred as well as helpless anger for sethe's mother saving sethe from this type of a death was also an act of pride for her mother as she wanted her race to survive sethe's act on the other hand had resulted from the compulsive love of a mother to safeguard her children we have seen how in the previous novel sula eva had killed her own son she had claimed maternal omnipotence after killing her son to shield him from a slow death by addiction this can also be understood in the context of sethe as she did not want her children to suffer in the same manner in which she had sethe's troubles had gradually unfolded in sweet home which is a farm in kenchuki it was kept by garner as a model of good ownership she had enjoyed 6 years of semblance of a family and she had been able to watch two of her sons bugler in howard rolling down the patches playing around in pleasure 
This happiness was denied to her mother-in-law. Baby Suggs had to see seven of her children being sold into captivity at a very tender age. She was unable to imagine their looks at a mature age. The slave owner Garner allowed limited choices to his slaves. Nonetheless, they were certain choices in a land of choicelessness. For example, the choice of buying liberty to a mother at whatever cost, the liberty of handling guns within the premises, learning to read and moving freely inside the property. This situation changes abruptly when the school teacher and his nephews take control. Under the tutelage of the school teacher, his nephews learn to turn people into animals, pushing the slaves to plan an escape to the magical north for survival. As a mother, Sete had loved her children while she was living on the plantation. When she is able to escape to the north and is able to survive with three of her children, she realizes that in a free atmosphere, love also expands. As she was able to love her children without having this worry at every moment that they can be sold the next day into a different captivity. Sethe is able to spend 28 days of freedom. After this time, she suddenly sees the school teacher and the sheriff coming towards the house so that she can be carried back to the plantation along with her children. When she sees them coming towards her and her family, she just flew. She wants to kill all her children but only manages the murder of one. When she comes out of the jail, she still has some satisfaction. And I quote, I stopped him. I took and put my babies where they would be safe, unquote. Killing one's own child by a mother has always been considered as one of the most heinous crimes. A mother risks her own psychic hardships when she is forced to take such a decision. Sete also has to risk it. She has to risk her psychic well-being and at the same time, she also has to risk the relationship between herself and her living daughter Denver, who is scared of her because of the infanticide. She wants to spare her child a future equal to her own past. Sethe's behavior at this juncture testifies to her power of self-determination. Her maternal omnipotence enables her to decide over her child's life and death in a rare courageous manner. The warlike behavior of striving against odds is usually associated with male conduct and therefore gender blurring is evident again. Sete is considered as a member of the weak gender. Women are normally considered as being weak. She is also pregnant with Denver, but still she is able to manage her escape. She finds a job and raises three of her children without any male help. Despite the experiences of her past as a slave, she states that not since that other escape had she felt so alive. The fact that she has been able to successfully fly from captivity is a testimony to her mental as well as her physical courage. Another aspect of gender blurring, which is illustrated in the novel, is helplessness and despondency of black men. Among other attributes, manhood is normally understood as a state of being self-possessed. It is related with one's capability to earn property and money and keep it also. It also is associated with one's ability to protect one's family. Slavery had systematically deconstructed it as it is shown in Beloved. Whereas on the one hand, we find that in a woman character like Sethe, it had resulted in a more positive self-worth, in a more positive concept of self-assurance amongst men, it has had a debilitating impact. It is commonly understood that men are able to possess a sense of possession through love as well as marital ties. Their capability to protect 
their love, take care of their family, provides them with certain pride. But this is automatically cancelled by the abnormal ownership of slavery. The white masters were the definers and as Morrison has aptly suggested in Beloved, definitions belong to the definers and not to the defined. Slaves were not even allowed to marry by choice. In Beloved, Sethe desires to get married to Hall. But Mrs. Garner does not take it seriously, instead she starts laughing. As she knows that Hall and Sethe would anyway be separated if any one of them is sold away in the manner Paul A. Garner had been sold. Non-agentic roles had crippled manhood in slaves. When Hall witnesses that Sethe's milk is being stolen, but he is unable either to oppose it or to protect her, he is not able to consider himself as a man at all. He is aware of his moral duty of protecting his wife, but his inability makes him pathetic. He is not able to be a man after this incident. In the same manner, we find that Paul D. changes. Paul D. had tried to escape to the north along with another slave. Paul D. is caught and then an iron bit has been put into his mouth so that he is unable to talk. When he is brought back to the plantation, he wants to talk to Sethe, but is unable to do so. At this moment, he feels that he is nothing and even the rooster of the farm had somehow more individuality. And he recalls how he cannot be his own true self anymore. He thinks that the school teacher had changed him and I quote from the text, I was not allowed to be and state what I was. Even if you cooked him, you would be cooking a rooster named Mr. But wasn't no way I would ever be Paul D again. A school teacher changed me. I was something else and that something was less than a chicken sitting in the sun on a tub." Unquote. Paul D is the only male slave of the plantation to survive. And he recalls these horrifying days, even years after he has gained his independence. And he keeps on wondering what he was before he entered the sweet home or before he became a slave. Even when he has reached freedom, the cumulative experiences of his past leave him deeply traumatized, forcing him to lock away his feelings in the rusted tobacco tin of his heart. He is unable to settle down, is afraid and therefore he is drawn to Sethe for her strength in the hope that he would also be able to have certain emotional sustenance. Such descriptions tell us that slaves were not given any identity at all. They were even denied individual names as the practice of naming them in alphabetic order testifies. Song of Solomon the third novel of Morrison, published in 1977, is also quoted as an illustration of gender blurring. It blends African-American folklore, history and literary tradition to celebrate the moral and spiritual revival of the male protagonist, a novelty in her novels. This novel was also cited by the Swedish Academy in awarding Morrison the 1993 Nobel Prize in Literature. This novel is spiritually grounded in the Afro-American folktale of people who could fly, meaning thereby the escape of slaves by taking flight. Morrison has treated the motive of communal flight as a solitary escape, escape of an individual who leaves the family behind. The contemporary folktale treatment drills around an unconventional name, Macon Milkman Dead Three whose quest for identity takes him to his ancestral place where he learns about his great-grandfather Solomon. Morrison suggests that the bequest of slavery and racism has created political, economic and cultural ugliness in the contemporary American society. She also subordinates sexism to racism and capitalism, suggesting that the African-American men's exploitation of their women 
is a result of their racial and class operation. The novel also looks at the impact of capitalist hierarchies as well as the sexist views of Afro-American men. Though Milkman's quest for his identity remains to be the dominant trend in the novel, a major obstacle he has to overcome is his father's need to own as much property as possible as a safeguard against racism. He also realizes that only when he is able to strip himself of the dominant class's views of race and class superiority, he would be able to look at women as his equals and understand the reciprocal nature of human relationships. Milkman had initially treated women only as providers of his need. His preliminal stage is marked by his lack of consciousness about his people's race and class operation. Interestingly, women characters of the novel become the gauge by which to measure his maturing race and class consciousness. The concept of gender blurring in Song of Solomon is clear by Morrison's interrogation of the myths of dominant notions of masculinity. She rejects notions of manhood which are based on economic success or property attainment. Rather, she focuses on more personal philosophies and blurring gender lines. She also questions the adoption of white definitions of manhood by African American men, a model she thinks as individualist, competitive, misogynist as well as destructive. The novel suggests that manhood should be rooted in community, cooperation, equality and constructive behavior. The novel also reveals the frustrations of African American men and the violence that often functions as a self-defining tool for them. This violence is often directed at women in a spectacle that divides the community across gendered lines. The use of violence marks black manhood in the novel when guitar and milkmen join the seven days, a group that kills white persons as vengeance for lynching as well as for other culturally legitimate murders of African Americans. The group sees these retaliations as a means of reclaiming black subjectivity as well as exacting vengeance against white culture. The novel discusses how violence replaces tenderness and love for guitar, becoming his means of interaction with the world. Yet even as Morrison has reflected these feelings, she has also been able to provide an alternative. Milkman, who had initially joined this group and participated in its rituals, is able to move beyond violence and come to find his identity outside it. The novel argues that the problem of masculinity does not belong solely to the individual men, rather it is a community issue and has to be taken care of accordingly. The novel focuses on Milkman's search for manhood. As he travels, he must discover how to be a black man, creating an identity that will integrate with the African American community. It is only when Milkman gives up individualistic notions of manhood and embraces the community, he is able to find certain happiness. His acceptance of his ancestral mythos, as evidenced by his final ambiguous leap, signifies his movement away from the individualistic notions of identity toward the communal model. So, we can see that in this novel, Morrison has destabilized notions of black manhood and suggested that all traditional identity structures are differential. And accordingly, black manhood has resulted from the repudiation of women as well as of whites. Slavery had denied manhood to black males while it had objectified black women and used them as means to assert manhood. Morrison also shows that the notion of pure identity is a white fantasy, providing in a state the reality of a communally constructed identity. An analysis of these novels suggests that Morrison has been able to demonstrate the arbitrary nature of gender characteristics through her prominent characters. 
Gender blurring in this manner demonstrates the fluidity of identity as well as its arbitrary connection to biological notions. Morrison has disrupted biological notions of gender and suggested through several characters that women can adopt masculine traits and contrary wise. It has been illustrated with the help of characters like Sulla, Sete and Paul D. Morrison's fictions have depicted a plurality of masculine identity formations reflecting the anxieties that African American men live in a culture that has refused to accept their masculine identities. In her novels, Morrison has been able to produce a more egalitarian model of masculinity, a model which disrupts traditional individualistic beliefs and reasserts the social dimensions of identity. She has disrupted reductive notions of gender, biological as well as cultural, placing traditionally feminine qualities in her male characters to blur gender lines and stress the cohesion of human beings. While she has been able to valorize the portrayal of her women characters, she has also been able to suggest a treatise on a manhood which is rooted in community, cooperation, equality and constructive behavior. She has taken issues with the adoption of white definitions of masculinity a model which she has portrayed as competitive and misogynistic one. Morrison has interrogated the myths of dominant notions of masculinity as well as femininity, suggesting alternative means for African American people to establish their selfhood while also reflecting their frustration at disempowerment. With it, I conclude my discussion of gender blurring in the novels of Toni Morrison. Thank you.